Greetings, dear sir or madam. I have always wondered what it is like to be a big media and news company employee who reads incoming public mail. What it's like to be on the receiving end of all those endless news story suggestions, personal stories, heart-wrenching pleas for help, shameless spam, profanity, and so on. What a brave job for you to have! And I am sorry to disturb you. You may take a break, stand up from your desk, and go outside. Take a breath of fresh air instead of reading my letter. Go on. Office work is so getting to the limbs. I have a story to tell, but I do not expect or lay claim to any response from you. First of all, I am a foreigner, and you've got enough of homegrown British stories, I wager. So, I offer this as just an exercise in writing. After all, I've been reading all those BBC stories for more than 10 years now. General news, personal stories, scientific reports. I have been consuming information on my dear BBC. So now I am going to offer something in return for all the BBC people's work. A small contribution. Once upon a time there lived a near immortal soul in the Siberian city of Tomsk. It was incarnated in a male body shape and had grown to be a boy. A boy like many other boys, at least as far as external trappings go. He had a common Russian set of names and attended classes at school. Everything seemed well at first, but the longer, the more he stood out from the circle of his schoolmates, unwittingly. He did not feel drawn to their society. He almost never visited parties. He was dreamy, intellectual, and romantic. He found great enjoyment in just walking around the school and the grounds alone after classes when the school got quiet, spacious, and filled with mysterious echoes. The boy's friendly and defenseless demeanor earned him frequent mockery and mean jokes from his more thick-skinned and down-to-earth peers. He was not an exemplary student. He daydreamed too often for that. But he had a flair, just one thing that he really loved in his school studies and was good at, the English language. Once, at a psychology lesson, the children were offered to answer a set of questions about their interactions with each other within their class of 30. Whom would you call your friend? Whom would you ask for help in need? Whom would you entrust with your innermost secrets? Whom do you see as your leader? With whom would you go to a party? And so on. Later on, 
The results of the individual questionnaires were summarized and represented graphically in the form of a drawing where each pupil was ascribed an anonymous number. The interactions between the pupils were shown by means of arrows. So the more people mentioned someone as their friend, leader, confidante, etc., the more arrows would point to his number from their numbers. There was at least one arrow from or to each of the numbers, except for just one number. It stood alone with no arrows pointing to or from it. Nobody aspired to that girl or boy, and he did not look to anyone either. When the drawing was put up on the blackboard, many heads were turned to our protagonist, and whispers went around. Are you the one that's all by itself out there? It can only be you behind that number. They guessed rightly. High school saw him move to a different institution so that he could pursue his linguistic talents to the utmost advantage. A linguistics vocational school where he spent the last three years of his secondary education. There the boy felt more at ease. He got stronger, more expressive, less timid. His passion of singing had lent him more appeal in the eyes of girls. He sang at small gatherings and even at all school events. But still, he couldn't help but see that the classmates around him and most of the people of his hometown in general were too unsophisticated, rough, vulgar, primitive in their aspirations, their inner emotional scope too meager, their intellectual grasp too feeble. At about the same period of time, our hero had developed a certain subtly dangerous emotional tendency in his soul. His overwhelming state of inner happiness, his passionate songs bringing about a state of euphoria, his candor, love of life, and his sensuality. All this had led him to believe that satisfaction of desires was the ultimate point and meaning of our lives. The young man, 17 by the time, had erroneously concluded that we should not restrain our desires, including sexual desires. Restraining desires? <laughs> Why, what a silly thing to think of, thought the youth. By no means. On the contrary, we should indulge them and have free sex with men and women at any opportunity. The more, the better. The young man resented the social and religious stereotypes dogmas, as he called them, which admonished people to have restraint and periodic abstinence. He laughed at religion and mocked it. To the university, the Tomsk state, his destiny led him on. Bright, flamboyant clothes, 
fearlessness, openness, an easygoing attitude, and a perennial smile, this was the freshman that we now see before us. Studies? Why? Who would care for French language lectures when there were so many pretty girls around? <laughs> that same year, a central restaurant opened in Tomsk, entitled, better believe it, Siberian Pub, marketed as a British harbor in the city and having a bas-relief sign over its entrance of a royal guardsman. The young man, twenty now, he of the rock song and love of English, he happened to be in a blues and rock band playing for the denizens in that restaurant. So luck would have it. Several local TV stories got aired, which featured him. Some girls passing him in the streets even asked for his autograph. That was the Cretaceous world before selfies, you will remember. Often, cozily huddled in an incredibly cute alcove, in one of the outlying stairwells of the pub. Out of everyone's sight, the young man thought, brimming with energy and happiness, I am the happiest person in the world because I can express myself in song for an audience, because I know the high truth. It is free love desire, and creative energy outflow. They are the only true values. They are the meaning of my life. This will never change. Yes, so he thought. The main character of our story was fond of tattoos. Quite in the spirit of the times and chiming in with the rock music subculture, he had already had two made on both of his shoulders. He did not think of having one on his forehead. No. Initially, it was not his longing or deliberation to have it made, but destiny intervened in the face of a not-close friend, girl, he knew. The subject just popped up in a conversation with her by chance. She almost, but not quite, subtly, we could say, caught him on a dare. But of course he had the guts, he said. And this was so in step with his extrovert persona. The magical why not of the open-minded, near-immortal soul clicked into gear. And thus he had had it made, that tattoo for all the world to see. The young protagonist thought that he only could believe what he felt and saw and heard. Feeling the compelling pull of his instincts, he could do no more than follow in what he would never at the time call blind obedience. He had finally acquired a friend then, at 20. It was a guitarist. He knew rock music extraordinarily well, and so 
there was always warm, soulful conversation between the two friends. And at one point, a frank discussion took place in which the young man was told that God was one. It existed and did determine the whole sequence of events in the universe. Now, from no other person would our skeptical hero accept such a statement. He would have laughed it off, scorned it, and spurned it. But a miracle happened. Somehow, in that friendly atmosphere, with the only friend who understood him, the youth felt that he did not want to surround himself with impenetrable walls of skepticism, shutting out the outside noise. The guitarist, by the way, was undergoing a strong life crisis at the time. His longtime girlfriend had left him for another man, and so he remembered about God. <sighs> it was then that our hero had officially changed both his given name and surname. So now we can call him Timmy Astor. Tim's old world had crumbled down into dust. The realization of divine presence had rushed into his comfortable inner world so acutely that he could no longer doubt the sentient nature of the universe, its deep logic which is hidden from the eyes of ordinary people. His powerful feelings of inner harmony, which had been with him since his earliest days, was telling him that there could be no possible doubt. Tim's intuition flashed active, and he saw the universal laws determining all sequences of events, both globally and in his own life. Everything made chillingly perfect sense. The subtle connections. He saw it so clearly, how the disharmony, incontinence, and inner emotional aggression of people ruined their lives and pushed humanity towards the line of no return. How all the events of our lives are interrelated. It was at the time that his feelings froze and he went through something we could call depression with the only exception, namely, that he saw the guiding light and knew that someday his emotions would come back with a vengeance. The young man's old world had crumbled and the new one was yet in the bud, unfledged, yet to take shape and to become fruitful and strong. And in the meantime, Timmy Astor simply existed. Existed, not lived, with everyday dull pain and the sensation of meaninglessness. He still tried to be nice to people, though, and not to take it out on them. But his erstwhile bright smile was gone archived and shelved, he opened his heart to the Bible and other transcendental literature. The slow healing had begun.
In a couple of years, Tim met the greatest love of his life up to that moment. A girl who was his best friend's four keeps. Uh, four keeps, a steady girlfriend or boyfriend, and now, in this case. They soon split up, Tim's friend and his girl, and she left for another city. The girl did not love Timmy Astor, was in fact closer to disliking him in the end, but she played an important part in Tim's fate. The stimulus that she had aroused in him made him want to feel more worthy of a girl, and that made him accept a crucial decision to start tattoo removal sessions. First, it was by means of an electrode, then laser, one, two, three operations, and more and still more. He did not mind the pain. He knew it was for a good cause, although he never hated his tattoo or his past choices. Never hate your past, or you won't have a future, knew he. When the global financial recession hit us, and Timmy Astor's parents fell low on money, he still had a lot of ink unremoved. So, desperate not to be at a standstill, he took a home-purpose hand electric drill and got himself scarred a bit with a special abrasive drill tip on the forehead. It was a lot of fun, first injecting the painkiller himself, and there was a lot of blood but the resulting improvement was negligible. So, after a couple of such makeshift self-surgeries, he dropped it. He got a sum once, good enough for one session at an expensive enough laser removal clinic. It wasn't the totally real deal, which you can only get in Moscow or Peter, but neither was it the kind of small, private, home-based laser removal of which there were many in Tomsk. Often it's a two-in-one. A tattooist often doubles up as a removalist, thus making double profits conveniently. The effect was visible, if only slightly. Now, after some more of his endless tattoo removal adventures, he only had about 20% of its initial brightness left. It was 2016, and his feelings finally unfroze. Thawed. It had taken 14 long years of patience, prayer, discipline, forgiveness, and abstinence to get back his big smile and his self-confidence. He did not hate the insensitive people who didn't care for the efforts he had put in to undo his errors. He didn't despise the lowbrow who hurled insults at him every time they saw his long hair, beard, or bandana. Or even the ones who tried to beat him up. Because he now loved, not in words, but truly on the level of deep inner emotions, habits, and reflexes, 
all people without exception. He started listening to the music of his youth again with full force and self-abandonment. The grass was green enough again and all was the same. Only now there was that new additional detail, an immensely stable, beautiful, earned and graceful sensation in the depths of Tim's soul, a love line of connection to the one who is always online. I still think that free love is key, but the notion of free love now means love free from overindulgence. Free love where free means not enslaved by depravity. Although I have a grave case of anemia, a weak liver, and still about 15% of the ink left, I have a healthy soul. And it is not something many people can pull out of their proud pocket in our time of general depravity, mental and physical illness, ignorance, the cults of aggression, money, status, and the ubiquitous callousness. I am not without my vices, no. There is always room for improvement, and a lot of it. But the Peter Pan of my youth has enriched his outlook. And although I have picked up my flying again, I do not fly too lightly nowadays. I look at the traffic signs. It is difficult to explain what it is like to be brimful of ultra-high subtle energy, to explain it to someone who has never felt it. I will put it this way, it is not physical, it is a totally different form of life. As our epoch fades to black in its last convulsions, fits and seizures, I wish you all good health, soul health. I hope to see you in the next installment. I want to call it something like Humanity Reloaded. <laughs> How about that? Oh yeah. I remember reading a BBC piece, the life story of a girl who had herself covered with tattoos, but at some point decided that she could turn it around. 